And without further ado, I'm going to give the stage to Mr. Ronald Haney. Very nice gesture. Thank you very much. Al went back to the sofa to finish watching the news, hearing the apartment door slam. Looking right from the sofa, he watched his grandson come walking quickly up the hall, entering the living room, bypassing him with the speed of a steam engine. All Dwayne thought of was quenching his thirst for three reasons. One, he loved the way Al mixed his favorite household drink, a great flavored Kool-Aid. Two, this particular May night was a pretty warm one and he'd been out since the early morning smoking reefer and shooting dice, pretending that he was in school as, as a soon-to-be high school graduate when he wasn't. And the familiar five-floor climb didn't help matters much. Last but certainly not the least, three, Dwayne had his premier dose of cocaine. Scheme convinced him to do a few one-on-one -on -one hits, which led to the purchase of more snow. They mixed cocaine and reefer together, creating another ill, more addictive effect. Reefer alone numbed and soothed his soul, troubled with the absence of maternal necessity. But sn snorting and sniffing the coke added a new heated speed and aggression to his psyche. Everything moved slower, while the circumference of life and the living moved away from his body at the same time all around him, at least 20 feet but he felt faster and he moved and expedited every move a lot faster. Dwayne soon snipped up $30 worth of cocaine with Scheme and smoked two blunts laced with the coke. The high totally blew his mind, making him slightly afraid. Fear was something Dwayne couldn't think about now. The numbing effect of the drug was annoying him. His thirst must be quenched. He disappeared into the kitchen. Al didn't budge, refusing to move a muscle. By the way his grandson flew into the apartment, he knew some form of trouble was imminent. It could be verbal, such as Dwayne cursing him out for no reason, or physical, like another swollen jaw. Something was bound to happen. From day to day, he didn't know what to expect. Al continued to watch the news while Dwayne gulped down the entire remaining quart of grape Kool-Aid from the container. He huffed and puffed, wondering what to do next, unable to control his numbing stupor of speed. Recalling the televised NBC Motown 25 special, Dwayne zoomed out of the kitchen, hyped, heart pounding, mentally moving at 10,000 miles per hour. He walked up to the television and started changing the channels, anxiously trying to find Motown. Al took deep breaths, trying not be to become upset. Maddie was 100% correct when she gave her husband her deathbed speech. Dwayne was truly bringing sorrow, suffering, and pain just as she predicted. It was like he was the devil in person. Not only did he enter the apartment without speaking, he just took it upon himself to change the, the TV to a program of his choice. He didn't even ask Al if he could change the channel, knowing that his grandfather was watching the 10 o'clock news. How cruel, how callous. What's the fool gonna do next? Al asked himself. He knew in his heart the best thing to do was let it go, pay Dwayne no attention, but he couldn't go on like this. Something had to give. I was watching the news, Al said calmly to his coked up grandson. Dwayne turned around and stared hatefully at his grandfather with a formation of sweat beads coming to life in his face, his eyebrows connecting. I want to watch Motown. You could ask. Ask what? Ask to change the channel, boy. That's rude. It ain't rude. I've been talking about that Motown shit all week. You know I wanted to watch, watch it. Watch the TV in your room. You think I'm scared of you, don't you? Ain't nobody say that shit, Pappy. Why you always gotta pop shit? You might have, you might have, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Nobody treats their granddaddy the way you treat me. Please, Pappy. Nobody do they people like you do me. Always hiding shit from me. You couldn't even tell me the truth about my own mother. You a liar and you a failure. What? I'm not a failure, baby Al. I love you and I hate you for keeping the truth from me. You couldn't, you lied to me about my mother. Al was stunned, his feelings demolished. Did his, did his grandson truly hate him? Surely his caustic actions was beginning to speak louder than words. Al refused to go down this time. You know the truth, boy. 
pick your head up, wipe the nose and stop crying. Like you told your West Indian friend the other day, just put an H on your back and handle it. He removed his glasses and inched his way to the edge of the sofa to make his point while Dwayne listened in an abnormally warm, numbing theory. Your mama died having you, but me and your grandma loved you enough to raise you. It ain't the end of the world. You know, your grandma had this thing left, had this thing, had, had, your grandma had this thing on called an aneurysm in her head, the doctor say back then, left us on Christmas Eve. I wanted you with me because you're my flesh and blood. Here, my flesh and blood. Baby, Al, you got to be stronger, boy, with all that squawking you do. You made out of Carter blood. Them cracker boys run us all out of Pine Bluff that night. Say there won't no KKK down there, and that that was a lie, cause I had to fight for my life. They hung my daddy in the slaughterhouse out back with our pigs. Them cracker boys was in the house beating on my sisters and my mama, and I done damn near killed them all, for they killed the rest of us. And when we got out of Pine Bluff that night, got them all on the train heading north for more than white boys came back to fetch us. They tried to find me in that boxcar and on that other train heading up north. And when I got to Harlem, your auntie's got to Detroit. They tell me my mama died of pneumonia and all I had was Aunt Lou. Look, that's you and this is me. We're different. You should have told me everything. And fuck this old black, old ass black and white TV. With, that, with his last comment, Dwayne punched the tel pushed the television from the stereo to the floor. The TV falling on its aged side. Screen glass cracking with one white streak in its middle. Two seconds passing and the television blacking out permanently. Al, the tender-hearted senior, was rancorous, filled with venom as he quickly maneuvered his cane to stick to stand. He felt his pressure escalating. Hobbling towards Dwayne, he raised his cane to strike, thinking the bitter teen would be scared. Dwayne hissed. What you gonna do with that, huh? Hit me, motherfucker? Dwayne hollered. Al raised his cane a second time when Dwayne punched him directly in the stomach. Grimacing with pain, Al crouched over and dropped his cane to the floor. That second, Dwayne slammed Al with, the, with an uppercutting blow to the chest that sent his grandfather flying partially across the living room, landing by the sofa, banging his head on the floor. Dwayne jumped back and forth, fists clenched, beckoning the dizzy hurt senior to fight him. Come on, pappy! You so fucking bad! Come on, nigga! You so fucking bad! Get up! Get up! Get up off the motherfucking floor! Dwayne danced on in his glory, demanding that Al join him in a boxing match. Al came to, after a few minutes, dazed and unaware of what happened, opening his eyes. Everything around him was a blur, with his crazed, coke up, coked up grandson dancing around his body in the style of a boxer preparing to win a title bout. That's an excerpt from W. What You Saw by Ronald Haney. Thank you.